This episode was made possible by Audible. Hello, welcome to Up and Adam. I'm Jade. Did you know that the sun gets brighter and hotter over time? In about 5 billion years, it will be so big that it'll engulf Mercury, Venus, and potentially even Earth. Sad. It naturally follows then that billions of years ago, the sun was dimmer. Let's jump back about 3.5 billion years. On cosmic timescales, our sun was just a baby, shining at only about three quarters of the brightness it is today. But what does a smaller, dimmer sun mean for Earth? Well, it means it wouldn't be as warm as it is today. In fact, 3.5 billion years ago, the Earth should have been below freezing temperatures. In scientific terms, it would have been a snowball Earth. But you know what else was happening about 3.5 billion years ago? Life. Around this time, life was beginning to form on our planet, and what is it generally believed that needs to be present for life to exist? I'll wait. Liquid water. Have you spotted the problem? How could liquid water exist on a snowball earth? Or did life somehow manage to form under the cold, harsh conditions of a snowball earth? As Dr. Malcolm says, Life, uh, finds a way. But how did you find your way? Let's go digging for some answers. Zircon grains and features in emergent crust indicate that billions of years ago, the earth actually did have liquid water. So these aren't really zircon grains because they're difficult to acquire, but let's just pretend that they are. By studying the chemistry of ancient zircon grains found in Western Australia, scientists have found that it's likely they formed in the presence of liquid water. On top of that, ancient rock in the Barberton Greenstone Belt in South Africa exhibits water-like ripples in the sandstone. Another piece of evidence for liquid water. So the general consensus among scientists is that 3.5 billion years ago, the Earth did have liquid water and was actually pretty toasty. As a consequence, life was able to evolve and flourish on our young little planet. But this brings up another interesting question. How could the Earth have been warm while the young sun was faint? This is called the faint young sun paradox. First introduced by astronomers Carl Sagan and George Mullen in 1972. How was the Earth warm enough to sustain life and liquid water when the sun wasn't giving off enough heat? I would never, in a million years, have guessed the answer. The most likely answer that scientists agree on is volcanoes and greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, fine, but volcanoes? This is a weird answer, right? But that's a cool thing about science, you wind up with the most unexpected answers. It turns out that the early Earth had a lot of tectonic activity. Slabs of the Earth upper mantle and crust collided with one another, causing earthquakes, mountain ranges, and volcanoes. When a volcano erupts or releases gas, it emits a ton of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide. As we know from human emissions, carbon dioxide can drastically change the climate and warm the Earth, especially when released in high amounts. Billions of years ago, during what we now call the Archaeon Eon, it's believed that volcanic activity was much more common than it is today. If there were a lot more erupting volcanoes, a lot more carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases would be released, keeping our young Earth nice and toasty. But there's more. Have you ever wondered how all the land on Earth formed? Honestly, before making this video, I had never even thought about it. It wasn't even like I was like, oh, how did that happen? I don't know. The question had never even entered my mind. And the answer is, partly, volcanoes, again. Lots of the land shaping our continents was formed through tens of thousands of volcanic eruptions, each one releasing magma from the Earth's mantle and lower crust and cooling to form exposed land at the surface. This process happened over billions of years, and back in the Archaeon Eon, it's estimated that only 2-3% to of the Earth's surface was land, compared to the almost 30% we have today. 
So what does this have to do with anything? Well, have you ever noticed how if you wear black on a hot day, it tends to make you even hotter? This is because black is good at absorbing the sun's heat. You want to wear white on a hot day because it reflects more sunlight. You probably know from experience that some surfaces absorb or reflect more sunlight than others. We can see this effect in a cool way in this picture I found on Reddit. A perfect leaf shape melted in the snow. How did this happen? The dark leaf absorbed more heat from the sun than the ice around it, heated it up and melted the ice below it. The measure of a surface's ability to reflect light is called albedo. The more light it reflects, the higher its albedo. The word sounds so much like libido, it's weird. A white t-shirt has a higher albedo than a black t-shirt. This leaf had a lower albedo than the ice around it. Different areas of the Earth's surface have different albedos. For instance, white deserts have a pretty high albedo reflecting lots of sunlight, and oceans have a pretty low albedo absorbing lots of sunlight. Since the surface of the Earth during the Archean Eon would primarily be composed of water and dark black rock from volcanoes, it would cause the planet to have a much lower albedo than it does now. As such, the Earth would have the ability to absorb more sunlight and heat up. In short, young Earth had a lower albedo than older Earth, so could absorb more of the sun's limited rays. So there it is, we've solved the paradox. Yeah. Early Earth was able to sustain liquid water and therefore life because volcanic activity led to more greenhouse gases and decreased the albedo of the Earth. Volcanoes get a pretty bad rap, but if it weren't for them, you might not be here today. And now perhaps the most important question of all, who cares? What was the point of this entire video? Well, understanding the early Earth and Sun isn't just important for understanding how life on our planet evolved, but for understanding how life might evolve on other planets too. Let's look at our nearest neighbour, Mars. Sitting at an average temperature of a cool negative 60 degrees Celsius, Mars is currently a cold, harsh place. If the Sun was fainter in the past, it's expected that Mars would have been even colder billions of years ago. However, we've found river channels and crater lakes on Mars. So just like Earth, Mars may have once been a warm planet with liquid water. And if Mars had liquid water, could life once have existed on the red planet too? Answering this question might take a little perseverance. As of February 18th, 2021, NASA's Perseverance rover is the ninth mission to land on Mars. Perseverance landed in the Jezero crater with a goal of searching for signatures of early life on Mars. Through collecting core rock samples, scientists hope that Perseverance will allow for the first ever samples of Mars to be brought back to Earth to be studied, allowing us to learn if we had any living cosmic neighbours in the past. Ultimately, the more we understand about the relationship between the early Earth and Sun and the atmospheric and geological processes involved, the more we can understand about ourselves, life and other potentially habitable worlds. If you enjoyed this episode and are fascinated by space and the solar system in general, may I recommend a book? I've been listening to The Planets by Professor Brian Cox and Andrew Cohen. It's about the history of our solar system and why the planets are the way they are. We tend to think of our solar system as kind of always being the way it was, but it was actually very chaotic and so much of how it is is just random chance. Like the size of Mars is largely due to the orbits of Saturn and Jupiter. Mercury, Earth, Venus and Mars all formed in pretty much the same way, yet because of the fragility of the solar system they all turned out so differently. It made me even more amazed at the fact that Earth just happened to be right for life. It's also an amazing feat of humanity that we were able to figure out so much from basically studying rocks. If you'd like to learn about the interconnectedness of our solar system and how we came to be here, you can listen to The Planets for free by signing up with Audible using the link audible.com slash upandatom. Audible is an audiobook service with thousands of titles, guided fitness, sleep tracks, and more. I read a lot to make these videos, so sometimes it's nice to just sit back and let someone read to you. In the car, on a walk, wherever. 
If you'd like to support the channel and make time for more learning in your life, sign up to Audible with the link audible.com slash upandatom for a free 30-day trial, where you'll receive your first audiobook completely free. I really would recommend The Planets, but of course, it's totally up to you. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next episode.